All right, I'm here. And I had a little bit of a snafu uh, with the link that I sent out and it wasn't allowing me to go live. So I had to start a new video. And what I'm going to do real quickly uh, is reach out to We Need Water and let them know. Um, just gonna tell them by text. Mike, I'm on live YouTube. I had a feeling something like this might happen. It's our first time on YouTube and it's not as intuitive as you would think. So um, sorry about that delay here. And I know there was a lot of people who were looking forward to this and we advertised it on Facebook, but wanted to do it on YouTube because a lot of people don't really want to be on Facebook all the time um, or have uh, their accounts there. They'd rather look at something later um, on another platform. So, just to um, introduce myself really quick, my name is Jesse Bloom, and I am an author, uh, a business owner. I own Northwest Bloom Ecological Services, and I am in the field doing landscape work um, and consulting with folks every day. And right now there is uh, the pandemic happening. And so we have this opportunity to, uh, those of us who are at home, um, to be out in our gardens taking care of of our spaces and really utilizing them so that they're um, benefiting us as well. But a lot of people have a lot of questions and a lot of people are new to this. So um, while I'm waiting, I don't think they got the memo that I'm over here. Um, I'm going to see if I can't change this really quick. Um, sorry about this. Normally tech stuff we try to figure out ahead, ahead of time. Um, so, and I have a lot of questions um, already. So we can, I can go back and forth from the live chat over there. Um, and hopefully we can can get this done here. I see there's a couple of people that have joined us. Please comment, let me know that you're here. Um, tell me where you're from, um, what you wanna learn about. And I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit. Um, say hi to everybody who has logged in from um, different parts of the country. And um, there's, there's definitely um, a lot to learn with gardening. So in an hour, I can't cover everything, but what I can cover is just a few topics. And to start, I should mention that this is sponsored by Cascade Water Alliance and the hashtag we need water and that program, they're all about conserving water and teaching people folks or folks how to do um, conservation efforts. So um, some of the questions I wanna just jump in right here is um, when to start watering. <clears throat> so watering, we need to do it um, sometimes as early as when we get the plants. Now, it all depends on how big the plants are when we buy them. But um, if we buy a plant, say this big, we need to make sure that the soil stays moist down in this zone um, for those roots to stay alive and to thrive. And if we're experiencing a warm weekend or just even a hot day, today it's about 80 degrees in the Seattle area. And we definitely have, um, we definitely have a lot of um, dry conditions in our soils. And I'm watering already. I've been watering actually since early April um, in certain parts of my garden, especially for the vegetable gardens and the seeds that I've started. But for some of the other plants that are established and have been um, in the ground for longer, at least uh, one year, they might not need water for a while. So one of the things that I did to prepare for this is I took a video and I walked around my garden and I put it up on Instagram stories so people could see. And, and one of the first things I noticed was one of my plants, Sedum Autumn Joy. So here it's the end of May. Um, sedum is a succulent in Seattle. Um, it's a very, very drought tolerant plant, but the new growth had already started flagging 
and showing us that it's thirsty. Um, so it's, it's fairly early for that plant, but it just goes to show that it's been kind of a, a strange um, season. We've had periods of um, really dry, hot weather, and then we've had periods of cooler, moist weather, but it's not really like it normally is, if there is such thing as normal anymore. Um, and I see a few people have joined, so please say hi. Use the live chat um, comment area. Tell me, tell me where you're from, um, what you want to learn. And while people are finding their way over here, I'm I'm trying to answer a few questions to get going. But <clears throat> in in the um, I'm I'm trying to read and and talk at the same time, which I'm not I'm not very good at. So. Um, yeah, and if, thanks for the comments for everybody who's trying to direct everybody. Um, sorry, I'm so sorry. It's kind of a, I'm not a very tech savvy person, so it's hard to learn new things. <laughs> I really am really good at gardening and not computers. Um, so one of the questions, what are some basic key elements and starting points to creating a backyard sanctuary? And how can it balance with needing space for kids? So that's a really great question. Um, and I do have show and tell. A lot of this is based around my book. Um, so this is a little shameless plug here, but this is Creating Sanctuary. Um, it's a pretty in-depth book about designing a space for yourself and your family that uh, can really nurture you. And so one of the first things I have folks look at is the intentions of what they want to create the space with or what they want to have come out of that space. So for some, sanctuary might mean rest and relaxation. For others, it might mean growing food. Uh, for others, it might mean wildlife sanctuary, or it might mean sanctuary for someone else. Um, so the first step is to look at that. What are our intentions? Because a garden that's going to produce food needs to be designed a lot differently than a garden that is just a resting space. Um, and the maintenance and the needs of that landscape will be a lot different. So considering our intentions first is a big step. And I always go back to that. Um, if we ever get stuck with our design, ask ourselves, okay, what was our intention in the first place? Um, and that usually can help solve a lot of problems. So when, when we have kids, the sanctuary can be for kids too, um, or for dogs. I see, um, there's a question about dogs. Um, we just have to choose the plants that can handle the amount of use or traffic, um, for dogs, animals. Um, I have horses, chickens, dogs, cats, kids. So I know how much, um, the, the landscape can take <laughs> for each animal or for humans and the capacity. And a lot of it boils down to, well, what kind of plants do you put in there? For kids, I have a, a nine month old who grabs everything. Um, and so I'm not gonna have her in a space that has a lot of rare or um, very delicate flowers. I'm right now she's like eating strawberries and eating things from the garden with me holding her. Um, but for older kids, so when you get three, four, six, they start to get a little bit more rambunctious and might like kick balls, um, throw things around. And so a little bit more damage can happen. Um, and I like to provide places for them to to seek refuge or to have their own little space and they can design it. Um, so I'll often create like a, a, an area and say, okay, let's create a kid's garden just for you. Maybe it's a, 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 a teepee out of uh, bamboo shoots or poles. Um, maybe it's, they are digging in the, in the soil at that age. Kids change so fast that um, if we design a landscape for them at five, six years old, in two, three years, they're going to be evolved past that landscape. So really it has to be adaptable for them. Um, and dogs, it, again, it depends on the dog. Probably um, a little chihuahua is going to be much different than a Malmute. And so we got to consider plants that the animals can, can tear up, so to speak. I have a terrier. I have two terriers. Um, and one likes to chew up grasses, like the ornamental grasses. So I'm learning that's not a smart plant to put in my garden. Um, but they'll also like to fetch and they'll pummel through a landscape. So I've learned to design a space to throw their balls. Um, and that's something that I've kind of created um, on the fly as my dogs have gotten older. So, and the other thing about 
sanctuaries. It's not just for us. It's also for the wildlife that have been here before us and that really help our ecosystems thrive. So in the book, I talk about creating insect hotels. Um, I talk about growing plants for pollination um, or pollinators. So really, you don't have to become a beekeeper to have pollination um, surfaces in your garden, but you do have to have flowers. And that's one of the easiest things that we can do is actually just um, plant lots of flowers. And this time of year, it's not hard to do to find. Um, one of the challenges actually from a design standpoint is to find the off peak flowers. So the, the ones that are growing um, outside of spring typically. And depending on the temperature, um, most bees in particular or pollinators aren't out unless the temperature is above like 50 to 55 degrees. So depending on where you're at in climate, um, look for flowers that are blooming in that period. But also um, around here, for example, like we have overwintering uh, hummingbirds. And so having winter forage for them is really important. That's another design element that I, I go over um, in the book. And the other thing is water. So we're here because of a water sponsorship and um, we all need water. Um, so that's something to think about in our gardens, not only for our plants, but for insects and for birds, for different critters that need it. And I like to do water bowls or dishes, a little bit different than a bird bath, um, but similar in, in style, I guess, or, or idea. I also like to do bubbling stones. Um, I don't know if you can hear it behind me. There's dogs barking and kids down the street, but I have a little bubbling stone that re, uh, recycles the water and it works really well. There's birds all year round. You see bees in it all the time. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, critters out there. And in order to get them into our space, we do need to have water, um, even if it's just a little dish every once in a while. So I see we got some folks from Seattle. I'm checking in on the comments here. Um, shady spaces. So. Um, one thing that I just did is I, um, I just uploaded to the YouTube channel here a video on ground covers for shade. So anyone who wants low maintenance plants, that's the biggest factor of your garden that's going to make it less weeding, less mulching, less watering is to have ground cover. It's a great way to create a, a living mulch, um, beauty, um, erosion control, and depending on the actual species that you're using. Um, it could be a really beautiful plant, but there's there's a lot to know. So I focused on that video in shade um, in my garden. So spring shade plants, and there's some things that are blooming right now um, that won't be blooming in a couple weeks, but um, it's worth paying attention to the seasonality of some of these plants too, when you're designing, looking at not only designing for right now, but for year round, or depending on where you're at, when you're gonna be outside using the space the most. And ground covers, I like to have as many ground covers as possible. Um, and for shade, for example, I have sweet woodruff growing. That's one of my favorites. It's also a medicinal. It's got a really beautiful little white flower and it spreads really thick and dense. Um, other plants that I have and I talked about were viola. Um, I'm just looking down, I'm cheating. Um, ladies mantle. Um, I have a, a yellow lamium that I really love, um, not to be confused with the invasive one. And that's a, a topic around ground covers and, and different plants is the invasiveness of them. And so um, whenever you're looking at plants, maybe consider that. Not all plants are bad if they spread, especially if you have a large area that you would otherwise be weeding, mulching and watering. So looking at ground covers that will take up that space, I think are really important. Um, so yeah, there's lots of plants for shade, um, shade gardening. It's one of my favorite things. Cause at this time of year when it's hot, like it was pretty much 80 degrees today. I didn't really want to be in the sun. I wanted to do all my gardening in the shade. <laughs> so, um, growing food in the shade is a little bit more challenging. Um, but if you are going to try growing food, a lot of the greens do well in the shade. And then my favorite for shade are natives. So native plants, um, depending on your region, you want to look at where they thrive naturally and then look for those spaces that are similar in your garden. So for example, um, trillium, 
which is a Northwest native here, likes to grow in some really, really amazing soil um, in the forests. We might not have that same soil here in our garden, so it might be a little bit tricky to get them going. It's definitely not a plant I would recommend if you have rambunctious dogs or kids because they will topple it and then you'll maybe cry. It takes years to get um, trilliums going. So yeah, there's a lot, um, lot of plant lists out there. So if you're looking, make sure you consider the zone that you're in, how much space that you have. When you're choosing plants, I like to think of a little box. Um, so if our space is four feet wide by six feet tall, um, and you don't want the plant to get any bigger than that, then make sure that you're choosing plants that won't grow larger than that genetically. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make, or, or actually a lot of people just adopt it um, from when they, they purchase a home or move into a landscape, is plants that are too big. Um, and what that means to me is that it was just planted in the wrong place. Um, around here, it's a lot of roadies, um, a lot of plants that just grow and people hack at them. And then they end up being misshapen or get sick and they aren't really appreciated or taken care of. And so oftentimes we end up taking those out or moving them into, a, um, into an orphanage, which we have at our nursery. All right. So I'm going to jump over here. Um, what are drought? What are good drought resistant plants or trees creating a new landscape now? So um, one of the things to talk about regarding drought tolerance um, is that that concept doesn't mean that you can plant it right away and it's never going to need water. It means it's still going to need to be established. And I think there's definitely um, a there's a lot more to it. There's preparation of the soil, making sure the exposure exposure is correct. But if you're looking for plants that don't want a lot of water, look for plants that naturally come from those types of environments. So what's really popular um, in this region is plants from the Mediterranean area. Um, so lavenders, sages, um, and but depending on how cold it gets, those plants might not be happy as well. So looking regionally at what grows is most important, I think, to or finding that that solution into what plants are going to do well in your garden. Um, so the zone is, uh, the USDA zone is what you want to look for, for how cold the plant um, can tolerate. But um, definitely consider soil and mulch when it comes to drought tolerance, because um, the first couple of years will make a huge difference in the, the root growth of that plant and being able to withstand drought. So when to start uh, watering? I answered that when um, I first got started here and not very many people were on, but which types of plants will need to be watered first? And I think of plants, my, my analogy is that plants are just like kids. And the younger the plant, so seedlings, um, four inchers, the little guys, they're going to need a lot more care and attention than a mature tree, for example. Um, so if you started with seeds and the roots are only this deep and we have a warm weekend, we're going to need to water so that, that that root zone doesn't dry out. So when you purchase a plant, if your root depth is a gallon, um, so that's usually about eight inches, that plant will need to be watered at that depth because the roots are growing down there. And so one of the mistakes that a lot of people make with watering is they just water over the top and that um, doesn't always get to the depth of where the roots are that need the water or it creates a situation to where the water, um, the roots are only dependent where the water is growing, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of times people will run a sprinkler and they'll have to run it all the time because the water is not getting very deep and that's where the roots are. And if the sun is warming up just that top inch of soil, then they're gonna dry out a lot faster. So the key is to water uh, deeper and less frequently. And what that does is it essentially trains the, the roots to grow deeper and then that's when they become more drought tolerant um, overall. All right, so checking in on the comments here again, um, seeing if I missed anybody. Um, and I know that we had another feed here. I'm just going to go back and forth really quickly. So if you have any questions, definitely, um, definitely ask here. So 
native plants um, that songbirds like. Almost every native plant um, has some benefit to our local ecosystem in in who uses the plants. Um, so that's that's a depending on which type of birds you want, um, it might come down to having a good shrub layer. They like to be able to perch and hide out in shrub layers um, or have nesting areas. I also mentioned water earlier. That's something that um, birds really like to have access to. I, um, because of my bubbler, we have a lot of birds that frequent the, the water feature. And this morning, actually, they woke me up at four o'clock in the morning, birds did, because um, I had my window open. So um, you can definitely get a lot of birds if you have running water um, as early as 4 a.m. apparently. So it looks like some people had a little bit of hard time getting over here. Um, I have a um, question, why would my plants look dry when the soil is still wet? It's only happening on hot days. So that's from Isabel. Um, that could be overwatering. Um, I should mention that the number one thing I see um, new gardeners um, really have to learn is how much to water and when. And so one of my tricks or rules of thumb is actually to do a finger test. So if my plant went in and it was a four incher, I will stick my finger in um, at that depth next to the plant in the soil. And if it's moist, I don't water. Uh, if it's, if it's um, dry, then I do. So it's something that you have to check and watering is one of those things that it depends on the soil temperature, it depends on the air temperature, um, the moisture levels, but also the plant health. Um, because if there's not a lot of roots to uptake that water that you're watering, then um, it's just going to sit in moist soil and drown. Uh, right now I have trays of seed starts and I tried to do them all together based on their water needs. But what you'll see is um, the, the plants that take a lot of water that are growing really fast are drying out a lot faster than the plants that are slower growing. So I, I, had, I made the mistake of putting pumpkins and cucumbers um, seeds next to uh, peppers, which the peppers are a little bit slower to grow. They need a little bit more heat. Um, and so I'm constantly watering the squashes and the cucumber um, and the pepper are, are still moist. So every plant is a little bit different. And again, I, I relate them to people um, and how hard maybe like a person might work and become dehydrated um, or what their, their environment they're used to um, will mean, you know, they need more or less water compared to the next person who may be doing less activity. I hope that analogy makes sense. It's kind of weird talking um, to a screen and not having um, the feedback necessarily um, to talk. So let's see. Um, I If I use a lot of wood chips in my landscape, should I add nitrogen to the soil? Okay, so there's a um, common idea that wood chips rob nitrogen. And as they break down, they use a lot of nitrogen, um, which is great when you don't want weeds to grow. Um, so for example, if you're mulching an area that has older plantings um, or a landscape that has um, plants that are already established and don't need fertilizer, you wouldn't necessarily put wood chips though in, uh, in a new vegetable bed. Um, and if you did, you would probably run into some problems. Um, you need a more fertile, um, organic layer in, in that soil versus un, or undecomposed wood. So I wouldn't necessarily add nitrogen. And again, some of these questions, um, and I love to be able to answer some of the general questions that help everybody, but there's so many, it depends. That's the classic permaculture answer. If one landscape is deficient in the soil, um, we might see that in the leaves and um, the deficiency coming out and, and the, the leaves turning a yellowish. And that would be an indicator maybe that there's nitrogen needed. Um, but in general, um, established landscapes aren't going to need 
a lot of fertilizer unless you're taking from them. Um, so trees and shrubs, um, there's very few that you're going to have to fertilize down the road unless they're fruiting um, and you harvest. Um, the other thing to consider is if you're if there's a leaf drop and those leaves are being raked away, that's oftentimes the nutrients that the plant needs for the next year. So um, you either have to mulch to make up for that or fertilize. But I usually look for a leaf and I'm looking around here. I've got a lemon behind me um, and it's got some nutrient deficiencies. Um, now it's the Northwest and a citrus is pretty hard to get going. I did manage to get um, some fruit out of this, but I don't know if you can see that. Um, I've actually had to Google several times for this plant because first it had scale um, and I ended up literally like washing each leaf and like scraping with my fingernail all the scale off. It was kind of gross, but um, it's happy now. But I ended up having to buy a citrus fertilizer um, because it had some nutrient deficiencies. And that's because I'm taking it in and out of my house um, at different seasons. And then like right now, um, I'm going to turn the computer so you can see a little bit more. Um, it's got a watering dish. So this is something that helps me not have to water so often all my outdoor plants or um, I bring my my plants outside and put the, them into trays. But the problem with that is they don't like sitting in water. So I have to come and dump it out. But what happens if you have too much water running through the soil is it leaches the nutrients out of the soil. Um, and so that's why we're seeing this. And these smell amazing, by the way. If you haven't tried growing citrus, um, it can be really fun. They're very thorny though, so you gotta be kind of careful. And this one has some new fruit on it. It's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, as I look around on my, my deck here, I have a lot of plants in pots with saucers underneath to capture the water. Um, so another question here, what is an inexpensive way to create a tiered garden when you have a sloped yard? Ha, I did a video on that um, a few years ago actually. So check out the YouTube channel. Um, and I showed lots of different ways to do it um, using log rounds. I see someone's offering log rounds um, <laughs> in the comments here. So maybe connecting with someone like that and um, building terraces with something that isn't a hardscape material. Um, but there's lots of different ways to do that. And one of the great things about um, terraces is that it helps retain moisture versus a slope, which just allows the water to run off. Um, so if you create terraces, the water can stay in those areas. And when it comes to vegetable gardening, I think that's the most important type of gardening where we would need to terrace <clears throat> with other ways of um, gardening like a wildlife or a native landscape you might not have to but it really depends on how sloped and just like the concept of water running through the pot um, a slope that's that same thing happens where the water runs through and leaches especially with sandy soil you end up seeing plants that have nutrient deficiencies and usually you're gonna see something like this um, you're gonna see coloration on the leaves. Usually at this time of year when plants put out their new growth, it's gonna be a bright green. And that's usually an indicator that the plant's fine. Um, for other plants that like fruit or vegetables, I, I should say annuals, we definitely um, need to think about fertilizing those at, um, at this time of year in particular to get a little bit of growth um, especially if we got a late start. And so I just went and purchased some fertilizer um, for the first time and we just started fertilizing um, our, our fruiting plants, our vegetables. Um, and then so I, I have hanging fuchsias. I have all kinds of plants around here. So, um, but I do wanna make sure that they're healthy and happy. And um, otherwise you get this and you're Googling and wondering what's going on. Is my plant gonna live or die? Um, and for something like this, it's kind of touch and go because a citrus isn't necessarily natural here. So I have to be really careful. Ah, I got a, a question here from Patricia Foreman. Hello, my good friend. Um, how do you water your chickens? Um, so yeah, we talked about birds earlier, but not livestock um, and animals. So cisterns, um, I have on every downspout, and again, I did a video just recently here with We Need Water. Um, every downspout on my house and my barn and sheds 
has a cistern. It doesn't have to be big and elaborate. Um, it could be a rain barrel, but down by the barn, we have cisterns that the overflow, because every time they fill up in a rainstorm, the overflow goes into troughs. And that um, makes it really easy to have water available to them um, for the rainy season, which for us can be quite a while. It can be like eight months. Um, and then in the summertime, the cisterns are full and then we can just release the valve on the bottom to water with the, um, the cistern water. So that's a, a great way to capture rainwater. Um, I think it's a really important thing to do. Um, any, a, anyone should be doing rain, rain harvesting, in my opinion, um, especially with droughts um, and water costs. It's just a really smart thing to do. So um, let's see here. Which plants in the Pacific Northwest do people most often make mistakes as being native and you have to correct them? <laughs> oh, um, that's a tough question. Um, I wouldn't say like terrible mistakes, but um, people don't space plants correctly. Um, they'll often put them too close together. Um, you've got to think about long term, how big is the plant going to get? How um, is it going to be happy? Like, you know, 10, 15 years from now. Um, other mistakes are just planting in the wrong place in general. Uh, that's a pretty big mistake where if um, they read the tag and it says partial sun, for example, and then they put it in deep shade or they put it in full shade or full sun, um, it can end up causing stress on the plant. Um, and again, relating them to people, genetically, they are predisposed to be in a very specific environment. That's where they evolve. That's where they're happiest. And so we, as gardeners, to get them to be as happy and low maintenance and easy um, care as possible, we want to try to get them into as close to that environment as possible. So if we're putting a full sun plant into shade, it's not going to be happy. Um, or if we put a, you know, vice versa, it's, it's like taking someone who's lived in California and putting them in Alaska. Um, there's going to be like some serious transplant shock and, you know, long-term it's not going to be good. So that's how I think about plants and where to put them is where will they be happiest? Um, can rhododendrons grow at 2000 feet? I don't know. That's a really good question. Where do you live, Cynthia? Um, I would have to research that one. Um, to be honest, I think you're probably out, you're more in the alpine region or subalpine region. And so, um, definitely look at what grows in that region naturally. There's kind of this, this point where either snow or the cold drops, um, and rhododendrons are broadleaf evergreens, which tend to be, um, um, well, they're temperate, but they, they like a little bit warmer, I think, than um, that height. So what other questions we got? Is it too late to harvest water this season? No, I don't think it's ever too late to get started harvesting water. In fact, right now is a great time. Um, and is it a good time to remove sod? Yes, that's another question that I think <laughs> you can do at any time. Um, it's probably going to be easier as um, the weather dries up because sod tends to retain a lot of moisture, um, especially if you're going to dig it up. I recommend sheet mulching, however, where you take uh, cardboard or a biodegradable material. My favorite is burlap, and then you put mulch on top of it, and that just smothers the grass, kind of like a swimming pool. Um, if you're a kid and you put out a swimming pool in the summer and it's dead by the end of summer, that's kind of the idea, but you're mulching it. So keeping all that biological goodness in place. Um, okay. It looks like some people are having conversations here. Um, I just want to make sure, um, tree mama. I'm not sure what the question is without reading all the comments here. Um, I'm doing a pallet garden for a number of reasons and the neighbors pine needles fly into the soil. Yeah. So make sure, um, oh, so someone said that roadies grow in wild in the Blue Ridge mountains. So um, depending on where that 2,000 feet is, it might be, might be doable. Um, okay. Okay, chemical constituents. If you use rounds from pines, does it stop a lot of the plants from growing because of the nature of the pines, the chemical constituents? So that's, a, that's another it depends question. Um, 
the biggest things to factor in, especially if you're using conifers, um, is the the different constituents and how they might affect, I think, more the soil um, biology. So if there's a, like cedar is a natural antifungal um, and that might inhibit fungal growth. Um, walnuts are allopathic, meaning they, they don't really want to let other plants grow near them. So they put out a chemical, um, kind of like a natural herbicide. So, um, it depends on what you're growing. Um, that would be, again, going back to like the very first thing I, I mentioned is what are your intentions? What are you going to grow? Um, and then is it a hugel culture? Like, are you burying the pine, the rounds, or is it an edge, like a, a bed edge? Because if you were just making a raised bed out of pine and, um, wrapping an area, I don't see that it would have any problem, but if it's a hugel culture, you might have, um, a little bit more of an issue. Um, but again, it depends on what you're growing. So, um, and how much pine I would tend to lean towards using hardwoods personally in any projects like that. But, um, I've used pine for a lot of different, um, projects and like the terracing, for example, that's a really good use of it or doing raised beds, um, or edging, um, pathways. That's another good use for pines. <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, can you recommend a good place to purchase cedar for raised beds here on Whidbey Island? So <laughs> the cost of wood and lumber has gone, that just skyrocketed recently. Um, we are having to charge a lot more um, and it's not the same quality as it was like 10 years ago. So I'm not sure I'd have to call around to find suppliers. Google would be a good bet. I have some friends that live over there that um, might be a good resource, but they tend to use like Craigslist and, and find recycled materials or salvage stuff. Um, there's juniper also. That's another material um, that usually comes from like Oregon um, but tends to be a good comparable material to cedar. Um, we have suppliers that we use depending on our job sites that are kind of all over Puget Sound from Dunn Lumber or Chinook Lumber. So, um, but prices for, for lumber are, they change, they fluctuate a lot. Um, and it's, it's an area that you would probably just be best calling um, so sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Mm, trying to get to the very specific questions here. Um, so can you talk a little bit about potential amount of rainwater you can collect? Oh, Mike. So Mike's from um, Cascade Water Alliance. Of course, you're going to throw me a math question that I should have at the top of my, like, I should know that. Um, I can't remember what it is. Um, it's it's something like 300 gallons per no it's more than that um mike you hopefully you can you can answer that i'm gonna have to pull out the practical permaculture book and cheat um my brain is in like fast mode um answering questions but you can collect an insane amount of water um from a very small area and with the amount of rainfall we get um one of the typical um, designs that we see is like a, a 1500 square foot roof that might be small by some like housing standards, but um, for about that square footage or like around 2000 in the convergent zone in the Puget Sound area, you can collect 70,000 gallons of water in one year. There's, ah, Pat, you got the answer is 550 gallons. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's, there's a, a formula um, that you use, you take the square footage of the roof that you're capturing from. And sometimes because the roof lines can get kind of complicated, you find the downspout and then you kind of look up or, or, or down satellite view, um, and count the square footage. But then you also multiply by the annual rainfall and that gives you, and then there's a, um, yeah, I should know this. Mike Brent, how about 300, 623 per inch of rain? See, you knew the answer. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a lot of rain for a thousand square feet. And if you add it all up for the year, generally it's a lot more than people actually use. So um, 
in their in their whole water budget for their whole house. So it's a it's a really fascinating thing. But you got to look at your annual rainfall. Um, you got to look at your roof line, and then how much storage capacity you have. Because sometimes people only have like five feet in between their house and the neighbor's property line. So getting creative with um, design for water harvesting is something that can be really fun. Um, so more more input here. So Mike and, and Pat are, are um, giving a lot of information here to estimate in a collected year, take the square footage of your collection surface, divide by a thousand, multiply by 550, and then multiply the average annual rainfall of your area. Okay, so there's a couple different ways to, um, to calculate that amount. But in the Seattle area, it's a lot. Um, it's, it's a lot more than we usually use in the whole year. But the, the question is how much space do we have? So um, I'm a big fan of maximizing as much space as we can for water collection. I usually look at every downspout and kind of measure out how much space can we use. Um, Rain collection units can come in every size that you can imagine. Um, there's a water wall style that's kind of narrow and long. Um, that's great for those really narrow side yards. Um, I have one that's really tall, but it's a cylinder. It's about three feet in diameter, but it's about seven feet tall because that area is really um, narrow. So there's a lot of different options here um, for rainwater collection. And again, going back to the very first question is what are your intentions? Um, how are you going to use the water? That also helps guide in what you would um, design. Because if, if you're at a low grade, so say your garden is up here and your house is down here, you're gonna have to pump water uphill. If your house is up here and your garden's down here, then awesome, because gravity is your friend when it comes to water collection. So um, lots of little things to think about. Um, we went into depth with that um, in the Practical Permaculture book. Um, another topic I want to cover just real quickly, I got um, 15 minutes and I don't mind going over if people want to hang out for a little bit longer since I kind of stumbled getting started. Um, but the concept of rain gardens um, is a really uh, a powerful element, I think, in creating sanctuary because it helps manage stormwater in the way that it naturally should on a site. Um, and it also creates habitat and it creates this really beautiful space. In fact, now that I have my cord and it's not raining like last time, I can show you um, a rain garden, I, I think, if I can get the computer. This isn't quite like FaceTime, I gotta drag the whole computer over. Okay, see that little structure there? That's our tiny house and those two chairs. Um, behind those chairs is a rain garden. And in that rain garden is a plant called Fuki. And it's a perennial vegetable. Um, just see how cool that is. I mean, it's like, it comes up um, to my chest and um, it's a really, a really cool plant. Just visually and texturally, it's really stunning. Um, but I also have other things that grow in that area. And I wanted to talk about, um, um, one of my favorite plants, but probably some people's like least favorite, um, horsetail. So I, I said I was going to talk about weed control, um, and this, so when someone asks what is like a number one people have questions about, how do you control weeds? How do you manage plants that are, um, problematic or invasive in your landscape. And this is one of the number one plants that um, people come to me about. There's also a buttercup um, bindweed's my least favorite. Um, but I actually really like it. We actually grow this plant at the nursery and sell it um, because it's so useful. And rain gardens are a great place to put them because they um, thrive in that condition. It's actually a native. Um, horsetails have been around since the dinosaur ages. Um, one of my colleagues made a joke about how to get rid of horsetail and to, to adopt a dinosaur because that's what naturally ate them. Um, and I think that it's, it, it goes to show the resilience of this plant, but it's, it's so fascinating because when you look at the, 
the constituents, the chemical constituents or compounds that this plant has. It's full of silica, um, which is really great for skin and tissues. Um, there's a lot of uh, medicinal benefits. So one of my favorite things to do is to make a tea and then um, use that tea as a hair rinse. And then I also use it as a fertilizer as well. Um, so yeah, it does look like asparagus, huh? Um, <laughs> there's, so that's just one plant. Um, but one of the best ways to eradicate it is to create shade um, that will block out the sun so it can no longer photosynthesize. And that plant that I showed you off my back deck here, that Fuki, um, will shade it. In fact, I planted this hoping that this would spread and then the Fuki spread faster and shaded it out. So now I don't have any horsetail in that area. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, one of the the plants and topics to cover and i mentioned rain gardens so it's a topic just like rainwater harvesting and design um there's there's a manual <laughs> and i want to show you this because there's a pdf online and it's my favorite resource and i send all my clients the pdf so if they want to learn more they can um but it's beautifully done um it teaches you all about rain gardens um, how to make certain calculations so that you know how big to make the rain garden based on how much rainfall you get. So here's a map of the Puget Sound and the red areas um, get less than 30 inches, whereas the, the dark blue get over 90 inches. So you can see there's quite a variety um, or a range of rainfall in this region, as there is in a lot of regions. We just happen to get a lot, um, a lot more than, than most. And so what rain gardens do is they help take that excess water. So when your cisterns are full, um, they end up doing um, the, the work that the soil would have pre um pre-construction and and help absorb that that water that extra water and give it a, a space to go back down into the the soil um how do you propagate horse hair? <laughs> but you don't really even have to it just it just spreads so again plants like to grow where they're happiest um and so if there's not rain fall or, or water collecting in a space, it'll stop growing. There'll be like an edge that it stops growing. Um, and if you want to propagate it, you dig it up, um, plant it where it has some moist soil and it will take off. I don't know that I'd recommend that um, unless you're doing a rain garden or something, because if you have a moist area, I mean, I guess every, every garden is different. If you want to use it for its silica, um, I know I have a lot of friends who go and look for it because they don't have it in their gardens. They go forage it. So um, if you want to use it a lot, just make a rain garden and plant it there. There's different kinds of horsetail. Um, this is one of the native varieties that happens to be evergreen. It's one of the reasons I really like it. Another reason that I think these plants are especially great, um, and all plants that are tubular. So if you can see that there, it's like a straw. Um, Plants that have cylinder stems are often really great um, habitat for eggs and um, critters. Um, I used to do wetland surveys where I'd go out in waders and different plants um, have different critters that attach to them and their eggs. So um, having this type of plant in your landscape, you might end up having some friends that you'd never expected. Um, and that's, that's always fun too. I had one client complain once that they had too many frogs after having a rain garden. So um, just like the birds waking me up at four in the morning, I guess they were a little too loud, um, which I guess that can happen, but I'd much rather listen to frogs and birds than other human activity um, in the middle of the night or the morning. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, of little things to, to teach um, wondering if there's any other questions. I see one question, wet leg tree ideas, lots of sun, but a wet corner of the yard. So I'm curious what wet leg tree means. Um, a tree that likes um, um, wet feet. If you could answer, I'll get back to your question. But in the meantime, um, the handbook, um, the question, the name is the Rain Garden Handbook um, for Western Washington. And it's actually authored by a lot of people from Western Washington University. 
So um, principal author is Chris Curtis Hinman, and then there's a, a list of people. Um, how you find it is you just Google um, Rain Garden Handbook WSU, and you'll find the PDF. Um, so that's definitely um, a really awesome resource. Um, I'm a huge fan and recommend that people take a look at that if they're interested. Um, and again, if you're not in Western Washington, there's a, you know, a little bit more to figure out, but um, a lot of regions that have stormwater issues are um, now putting out a lot more information. So um, Cole, yes, wet feet, but full sun. Well, um, when it comes to choosing plants, if you remember, I said, what's the box that they're gonna need to grow in? How tall can it get? How wide? Um, that's the first starting point that I would look at because if it can only get a certain height, then we need to select a tree that doesn't get too big. Um, so height wise, I mean, I could think of all kinds of plants and, and what your intentions are for the site. Um, if you want to grow medicine or if you have a really wet area, I'm a huge fan of, uh, weeping willows. Um, if it's really wet, they're just gorgeous, but you got to have a lot of room for them. Um, and they're weak wooded, but you don't want to have them near like septic field or, or drain field um, because their roots will seek out that water and they have been known to cause damage. But uh, willows are really great if you want to um, make your own rooting hormone. It's one of my favorite uses of willow. You take the tips, you chop up the stems and you put it in water and it actually is a homemade rooting hormone. So um that's a fun one. You can make basketry out of willows. Um, uh, the bark actually contains um, medicine. Aspirin was derived from willow bark. So that's just one plant. I'm thinking um, from the book Creating Sanctuary because I, I did a whole list of um, what I called the sacred, sacred plants. I chose 50 plants in each layer of the landscape. So trees, shrubs, ground covers, perennials. Um, in willows at the top of my, my sacred tree list, um, for wet feet, um, elderberry for wet sun. Um, I'm not sure if that's a question, but, um, you could definitely, um, it depends on how wet again, there's a lot of, it depends. And sometimes I have to see a site to be able to give the exact answer. I know that our native elderberries can grow in moist ish conditions um but don't necessarily thrive as much as they would if they had drier soil or or well drained soil that may be a better way to put it um i did the same with my fruit espalier tree should i move them at some point full suns but the roots are always wet oh okay so moving them yeah transplanting so that's a big question that's coming up right now is um when to transplant plants that we got we put them in the wrong place so we're coming up upon our drought period and our hot period which all the new growth that the plants put out this year if we chop the roots and move it that new growth is just going to be stressed and possibly um, damaged um i'd say even if you do a good job a relatively established plant is going to um is going to have about a 75 to 50 to 75 percent chance of loss like actually dying so it depends on several things how well you water it how much root mass you actually um can capture because if you have to cut you know pretty big size roots the plant's gonna feel it um quite a bit so um, the older the plant, generally the harder it is to transplant. Again, back to that analogy of like moving someone from California to Alaska, it's kind of the same thing. But with better conditions, the plant can heal and grow and, and, and thrive. It's just, I would be really hesitant right now to do that um, in most cases, unless you have a week of like cool weather and we're starting to um, see less and less of that right now. Um, let's see here. I hope that helps. It's kind of, it's, it's a bummer to have to wait, but fall is the best time to move any plants. Um, Isabel, uh, in creating sanctuary, there's an image of a huge rose quartz. Do you have that in your garden? Any ideas? Um, yeah, I, I like crystals. Um, <laughs> I tend to have a, a large rock collection. Um, some of them are get taken outside in my garden and, and, um, otherwise they, 
they're kind of like my house plants, like they get to come in and out. Um, but ideas for creating rock art, there's, there, I have a ton of ideas for that. It just depends on what kind of rocks. Um, I always ask clients and, and people like, well, what's your budget? Cause we could get really elaborate or you could take rocks that you find in your soil and create something with them. Um, like a cairn, you can stack rocks. Um, you can make, um, mandalas in the soil um if you're if you're using small rocks in our work we use a lot of really big rocks and we create stairs we create walls um the we create beds like raised beds out of them so um yeah rock art can be really fun and elaborate it just depends on what's the rock and how much time do you got um or how much money because that's usually what it boils down not um I'm a, I'm a big fan of energy work. So, um, definitely incorporate that into the plant work as well. All right. Um, well, I am right at seven o'clock and I don't mind hanging out, um, for a little bit longer. Um, I see a, a note here from, from Jennifer. Um, and thank you for, for being on, um, you're part of the the water alliance in lewis county and stop crystal geyser that's awesome um one of the big issues around here and in a lot of areas um is the different beverage companies or water bottling companies trying to tap into our aquifers um and that's been a huge a huge issue in a lot of parts of the world um so definitely um definitely good to keep eye out and, and have people on the front lines preventing that from happening. Um, what services do I offer? Um, oh, and am I going to talk about plant sale? Yeah, sure. So my job, um, day to day, I do consulting and design work. Um, and then Northwest Bloom does the construction. So we were a full service company. Um, we stopped doing maintenance a little while ago because it's just, um, it's really hard, um, especially staffing and traffic. Although um, having a pandemic has helped traffic just a tad bit, but even barely reopening there's traffic already starting again um but most of my work is help is just going to someone's house and helping them with whatever they're they're working on um sometimes i'll call it coaching services if i come back i'll give you a list of things to do and um come back later on or we can do the proposal and the design and do the work and get it done um i'm also a writer and i do a lot of education i do things like this and um, teach classes um, and our nursery. So our plant sale, um, that is about to be launched. I'm so excited. I'm also really nervous. Um, we have over 150 different species that we've been cataloging on a square site to have a store so you can plant shop. And then um, it might be launched this weekend if I, if I can get it done. Um, it's a lot of work to do um, on the computer. But once you purchase plants, you come out to our farm in Redmond and you pick them up. Um, we have a lot of great things like that Fuki I showed you. We'll be selling horsetail. Um, so there's definitely a lot of cool stuff. Um, come free. Um, but yeah, check it out. Um, we'll be posting it on social media and then um, sharing all the links very soon. And I'll, I'll probably make a big deal about it. Um, so consult consulting referrals for Oregon. Um, oh, you might have to email me for that one because someone comes to mind. I can see their face, but I can't remember their name. Um, I have some some colleagues down there that I definitely can recommend for sure. Um, so thanks everyone for joining in. And if there's any last questions, um, my nine month old went for a walk um, with some family members. So um, I got a few minutes here, but um, I think we we could probably wrap this up and um hope hopefully have you guys come back for the next one and and yeah send me questions or if you have video ideas i'm because i'm home a lot now i'm like why not just bring the video um with me and make make little youtubes for people um so so definitely um um keep in touch I'm on YouTube now, Facebook, and Instagram. I do a lot of story videos on Instagram. I did a little tour of my garden today. So if you want to check that out, I talk about a little food forest area. Um, so, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I really appreciate your time and being here. So, oh, cherry tree. 
uh, yeah, I have to share that. My cherry tree's name is Wanda. Um, and she's a Mount Fuji cherry, uh, which is this magnificent double blossom. Um, it's a very wide horizontal tree. And it's the largest one I've ever seen. And I've been an arborist for almost two decades now. Um, never seen one quite like her. But um, she is uh, named after Wanda Jackson. So if you know um, rockabilly music, uh, Wanda Jackson was um, the queen of rockabilly back in like the 50s, 60s. She's still around. She's still performing. Uh, but she sings a song called Fujiyama Mama, which um, made me think of her and Wanda because Wanda is pretty magnificent. So, um, yeah. Hope everybody has enjoyed this and taken some some little nuggets of inspiration and knowledge. Um, thank you so, so much.